interview with Mr. Robert Freeman Melville on 13 March 2001 at the Binghamton Armory. Interviewers Lieutenant Colonel Robert von Hassel, videographers Mr. Wayne Clark. Uh, Mr. Melville, tell me when and where were you born? I was born in Quincy, Massachusetts, February 3rd, 1925. Mm -hmm. uh, I was born in the Quincy Hospital. My parents lived in Braintree, Massachusetts. So that's home New England country mm -hmm. uh, for us, John Adams' birthplace and all that. Right. Did you grow up there? Grew up. We left that town when I was probably four or five years old and went to a small town called Abington, which is near Brockton, Massachusetts. And we lived there until I got out of high school and uh, I lived there until I left home to have a little adventure here. Uh, in when I was uh, 1940, well, it was January, February, January, February, no, February 1943 that I went in the Navy. <coughs> so I lived there until then. I <coughs> went to, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> went to, through to grade school and high school there. Mm -hmm. Did you work uh, when you got out of high school? I work worked, uh, yeah, I, uh, I had, well, at that time in one's life, uh, one worked whenever one could. And uh, while I was in high school, I worked part-time in a grocery store. Uh, I used to put in, in the summer, 51 hours a week for $9 a week. Uh, wages were a little lower then, but the $9 looked good. I remember we used to, before I worked in that store, the guy used to pay my brother and me for helping unload the groceries and put them on the shelves, and we'd each get three candy bars, which was three for a dime at that time. So uh, Then I, um, worked in a what was called a cut sole factory. This was shoe town, a shoe manufacturing town in New England. And I worked in a so-called cut sole factory. And uh, then they opened a shipyard there and I worked in a shipyard for a short period of time. Which shipyard? I worked in the Bethlehem Hinghamton shipyard, but that was started by Bethlehem Steel, which ran Four River shipyard, which built big ships. I mean, they, uh, they built carriers, battleships, uh, and they staffed the experienced people of this Binghamton, I mean, of this uh, Bethlehem Hingham shipyard. And I worked as a painter and helper there, and I got, I mean, I was getting 85 cents an hour for that. That was, that was big time money. And I worked there, my father worked there, my two brothers worked at Four River, so, for a short time. What kind of ships were you building? We were building mostly LSTs and LCIs, <clears throat> landing craft, and some of my jobs were crawling, crawling down in the ballast tanks and cleaning them up for painting. And I had some harrowing experiences just doing that. Like what? Well, for example, these guys would, were working there, had never been in a shipyard. And uh, one day I was crawling down in these ballast tanks and I was skinny and I could get down through and I uh, had a, a light on an extension cord and I'm carrying that with him and suddenly the damn light went out. And I followed the line back to where I'd come in because it was pitch black and I'd wound through all these places, you know. So I crawled back following my electric extension cord and <coughs> came out. Some guy had decided he needed to plug his line and so he pulled mine out. And uh, one day I was working <coughs> outside on the cleaning the bow of a of a ship for painting, and uh, I was standing on a scaffolding, and all of a sudden I felt a jig, and I looked down. One guy's taking down the scaffolding while I was standing on it. I mean, they were, it was a crazy place to work with a lot of inexperienced people, but I wasn't there long. It must have been very unusual, I mean, with all that war work going on and working around the clock and yeah, pretty hectic. Yeah, I, I uh, worked pretty regular hours because I was in a really completely unskilled work. One of my brothers worked in what's called the mold loft. If you're familiar with the shipyard, that's a key area. And the mold loft did the work for both Four River and Bethlehem Hingham. And for a while, until he went in the Army, he worked seven days a week, 12 hours a day. Just kept on going, because everything was dependent on getting that stuff out of the mold loft. 
Now, before we go into your experiences in the Navy, do you remember anything about being a young man uh, living in the United States uh, during the early war years? Did it oh, change yeah. the way people acted? Um, yeah, in some ways it did. On the coast, uh, we were subject to blackouts. Uh, and we had to have all the shades that had been pulled down at night and taped down. Uh, my father joined the State Guard, which replaced the National Guard when the National Guard was called up. And he had missed both wars, and I think he felt guilty about it, so he joined the State Guard. But uh, I think everybody knew uh, that when we got out of school, we knew what there was no. Uh, we didn't have any uncertainty about what we were going to do when we got out of school. It was pretty clear. But I don't think it affected much in other ways. Uh, I had left by the time the serious rationing was underway. There was gasoline rationing while I was still there. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was, uh, but none of us had cars except my father, so it didn't make What about civil sense. defense? Is that a big concern? Uh, there was talk about it, yeah. There was talk about it. It came with the blackouts and, and uh, they began talking about, um, well, there was, there was some expressed fear, some justified apparently, that, that uh, German U-boats were likely to get close to the coast. And uh, so there was a, a sort of a, a feeling that there were potential threats, but I think Especially for a young man, I can't speak for my parents, of course, but uh, at that age, as we all know, we all think we're immortal. Nothing bad could ever happen to us. Uh, I don't think we could do what you, what you do in a war if you didn't have that feeling. Uh, you, didn't, you just, uh, young people today have that feeling. They express it by driving in crazy ways and getting killed and things like that. But um, I think we knew this was serious business that was going on, but I don't feel we think we felt threatened. My own feelings at that time about the war were uh, I was uh, from the late 30s. I had felt the United States should be involved. And I think part of the reason I went in the Navy when I did was the feeling that uh, what was going on was our business as well as the business of people in Europe. So uh, I was uh, very, very supportive of all the attempts to assist the, especially England, um, and I was very conscious of all that when I was at that age. That was I was a fairly serious young man. Sounds like it. But that wasn't a very common attitude at the time, was it? No, uh, but, you know, there was, <clears throat> well, there were, a lot of, there were a lot of people, a lot of isolationists, a lot of people who said it was none of our business, and uh, so there was a real battle went on. But I think, um, more of that attitude existed, I believe, in the South, the Midwest, but in the in the East, there was a much more, much there was much more uh, feeling that, that this was something that was our business. This was something we had to be concerned about because we would be threatened. And that. Uh, how about your family? Did they show these sentiments? Pretty much, yeah. yeah. I never heard... Um, I was raised in a family of rock-ribbed Republicans, and I never heard of any criticism of Roosevelt related to his preparing us for war, any, any notion that he was threatening to get us into war. Um, they continued voting Republican, but that's because they could vote for Wendell Wilkie, and they supported Wilkie, who was talking one world, uh, the need for the United States to be involved. So he expressed the attitude that was very, that was more common even among the Republicans of that part of Massachusetts anyway. So. Now tell me, how, oh, well, one other question before you go into the Navy. Um, where were you when uh, you heard about Pearl Harbor? I was, yeah, I was in the city of Brockton, Massachusetts. 
where Rocky Marciano came from. And uh, I was there at a church thing uh, uh, in which my brothers and sisters, some of them were involved. And we were over there at this young people's church meeting on that Sunday afternoon when they announced what was going on there. And, uh, That was a that was a shocker. That was a shocker. There was no question about that. What did you think? What did the people around you? How did they react? Um, not with fear, but with determination. That we had to get in here and get. Now we got to really do something. And I think it erased any doubts uh, that anybody might have had about our need to be involved and not just a need to be involved in terms of defending ourselves in the Pacific, but our need to be involved fully in what was becoming obvious in World War II. So, so tell me how you came to be in the Navy. Well, uh, I, got out of, I graduated from high school in 1942. I was only 17. And uh, went off to the summer, for the summer to work at a hotel in the Catskills, looking for something to do, not sure what I wanted to do. And uh, I worked there. We, my, I had a sister who worked as a waitress in this hotel, and she got me a job up there. And then I came back and took these other jobs, went in the shipyard and so forth, worked in the shoe factory. But increasingly, uh, I wanted to, to get involved. and. Uh, Finally, I talked to my parents. My two brothers were older. Uh, they were still at home, and I talked to my parents, and they said, well, if that's what you want to do, we'll sign, because I was, you know, I wasn't old enough yet to, to uh, go on my own. And then, uh, so in, actually in December, early January, a friend of mine and I went in together to enlist in the Navy, and uh, you know, why the Navy? Well, I don't know. Uh, partly, uh, there was some of people used to say, you know, you join the Navy because the ships are so clean. Then you find out who keeps them clean. Well, I had joined the Navy because I figured they took my bed with me anyway, if I was at sea. Uh, and I didn't like the idea of slogging around in the mud. I didn't think I was cut out for that. And uh, I was tall then. By then I'd gotten tall, but I was skinny. We got in. My friend and I decided we'd go in. He was even a little younger than I was. And both of our parents agreed we could go in. And we hitchhiked into Boston, which was the only satisfactory way to get there from our point of view. And we got to the Fargo building, and uh, we went in, looked for the directory, and my crazy friend looks at it and says, oh boy, this is the Marine Corps in here, let's join the Marines. I said, man, you have, you've really flipped. No way am I going to join the Marines. I'm clearly not the Marine type. And uh, so we both ended up going up and enlisting. And uh, that came right at the time when they had, they had changed the law, and after be sometime in January or February, you could no longer, if you were over 18, you just couldn't enlist. The only thing you could do was register for the draft and go where you were told to go. You didn't have that free choice. Well, they were trying to get as many guys in as they could before this deadline, so they delayed uh, calling us. And uh, so we stayed around home until February, I think it was February. 12, 13, something like that. And uh, finally I got impatient. I called him back and I said, hey, I got, I'd been sworn in, but I just hadn't been called. I said, hey, I'm hanging around. How about, isn't it time to go? And the guy said, yeah, can you come in, you know, day after tomorrow or something like that. So that was in the middle of February. And, um, but I, it's, it, uh, I don't know, I've always, the sea has had a certain appeal for me, which it still does. I read a lot about fiction and nonfiction, about sea travel and merchant ships and everything else. 
So where do they first send you in the Navy? Sent to Sampson Naval Training Station, and, uh, which was a weird experience. We had a they were they were taking phys ed instructors and making them see chief petty officers and putting them in charge of companies to run them through boot camp and our guy was our chief was lazy and his family was moved up there with him and uh, if it rained you couldn't go out in the rain you might get wet or something you know so he was always looking for excuses to have us sit down and study our blue jackets manual or something but uh, Went through boot camp there in Sampson, uh, marched around in circles and did all the things one does in boot camp. Uh, learned how to make your bed and keep the place clean and stuff like that. What was Sampson physically like? Uh, cold, barren, right on the lake in the middle of the winter. It's a, it's a pretty chilly place. And, uh, they were still building it then, so that it was um, uh, still under construction. And it was kind of a mess up there, but not very appealing. Wouldn't want to stay around there. Remember anything else from your uh, boot camp at uh, Sampson? Uh, nothing in particular. Some of the craziness, I guess. Of, uh, there were there were in a barracks. There were two companies, one on each floor, and the. Uh, They'd come through for for inspection, and I remember one time they came through and they couldn't find anything to complain about the inspecting officer, whatever rank he was. He couldn't find anything to complain about in ours. He went up the stairs to the company upstairs, and then he came running down the stairway and threw a shoulder block on the standing phone booth that was in there, and he found dust under the phone booth, so he had something to complain about. <laughs> there was that kind of stuff went on. Well, what did you make of all this? I mean, uh, you come from a fairly rural environment, I guess, in Massachusetts. Yeah, yeah. And then all of a sudden you're thrown into the yeah. Well, I was, kind of, I was kind of bewildered. And, and uh, at first, obviously, very lonely until I got to know some people there and got to have some friends. I was, I was very shy, so that made it harder for me, I think. Um, the first night we got there, just to make a big impression on us, I guess. We got in a train in the middle of the night. And um, the first thing they did was they marched us into the mess hall to give us something to eat. First you got that metal tray, which was not too appealing. Then, it was everything, the mess hall was only open for feeding people coming in. The first they took a great big spoon and they dropped on there one solid chunk of spaghetti, which was kind of cold and it would just congealed, you know, and it hit that thing when I that. And then a, a badly bruised apple and a cup of cup of lousy coffee and I didn't drink coffee. And that was a that was not exactly a welcoming experience. And then of course in the morning they humiliate you by um, the first thing you do is take all your clothes and they pack them up, and then they go through and they're, they're hitting you with needles, one on each side as you went through. They'd, one guy hit you with one side, one guy hit you on the other side. Then they finally gave us a few clothes, which sort of fit, because they did it sort of by guesswork. Then they sent us swimming, and by the end of the time we were swimming in this cold water, we couldn't move either arm, you know. That was not exactly a good way to get introduced to the whole thing, you know, it was, uh, and as I say, I was very young. I was with a lot of guys from the Binghamton area, even though I was from Massachusetts. Uh, a bunch of the fellows who worked at IBM, and uh, some of them I got to know real well, and as well you get to know people in boot camp. It was a relatively short time, what was it, 16 weeks or whatever, so, but, uh, survived. <laughs> Where did you go up to Sampson? I was sent to the Quartermaster Training School in Newport, Rhode Island. What they did then, I don't know what they do now, what they did, they gave us all an examination of some kind, a test, and they asked us to put down in priority what kind of a school we'd like to go to for training uh, rather than go straight to sea. 
And uh, I guess I put first choice meteorological and second choice was quartermaster school. And I'm kind of glad I got to the quartermaster school. So uh, I, was, I graduated third in my class in high school. I came from a highly educated family. My mother was very well educated. We were all bright in our way, different ways. And I was quite a student. And uh, so I did well on this kind of aptitude test. You know. So uh, they weren't looking for meteorologists, but they were looking for a lot of quartermasters, I guess. And I ended up going to quartermaster school in Newport, Rhode Island. That was, that was pretty good. Um, the school was good. We had people, instructors, who uh, tried to teach us things and who, who became friends. And, um, there were a couple of crazy things. There was, a, there was a, uh, a regulation that prohibited leaving the island that this sits on in, in Newport. Well, hell, I only lived a short distance away, so if they thought I was going to take two days and hang around Newport, they were crazy, so I used to hitchhike home for a day. In fact, I took a guy with me once because uh, my sister was getting married and she, they were short of males to be in the service. And one guy went home with me. We were both in it. We were both ushers. And, uh, but nobody paid much attention to that. So. And they worked us hard. What kind of things did you learn? Well, we studied uh, the rudiments of navigation, this kind of thing. And... Uh, uh, A lot of time spent on that. And then also we learned visual signaling. We learned semaphore and, and Morse code light. Because uh, a quartermaster has to also be a signalman. And it turned out, as uh, will become clear later, actually I spent most of my time aboard ship on signal, as a signalman basically, because of the way my captain looked at the role of the signalman. He had to have a full complement of signalmen, which a destroyer doesn't really have to meet his needs. So they converted me to a signalman. I became a damn good signalman, as a matter of fact. Um, but um, we did that stuff for however long it was, for five months. I don't know how long it took us to get through there. Maybe that's what was 16 weeks in boot camp was shorter. But, um, and then at the end, we were all assigned out. Oh, and at the end of the training, uh, we went in as apprentice seamen. We came out as either uh, second class seamen, first class seamen, strikers, and I was one of the lucky ones, I guess, hard working ones or something. I came out of quartermaster third class. So I came out of petty officer before I'd ever set foot on a ship, which was, a bit odd, <laughs> but uh, so by that time I guess I was uh, beginning to push 18, and um, so after a very short stay at home, I headed to Norfolk, Virginia, where I joined the crew of the USS Twigs. Well, let me talk about that for a second. You came back home after all this Navy training and your Navy uniform. And what kind of reaction did you get? I don't know. Uh, my folks were proud of me. Uh, people were proud of me, I think. Did you see anything differently than you had before you left? Did you look at things differently? Well, I'd grown up some, fortunately. I was very young, as I say, when I got out of high school. And I think I was more... I was more self-confident, I was more assured of myself, more comfortable, in part because I had made good friends while I was in the training school, because that was, uh, we were in class together and we did things together more. And uh, so I was, uh, I think, uh, as I say, more self-confident, more assured of my own ability. Uh, I had an opportunity, which I hadn't had before, to in certain ways compare myself with others, and I found that I liked what I saw, I guess. I was pleased uh, that uh, 
uh, I was in a, in a kind of competitive surrounding with a bunch of guys, and I more than held my own. And, uh, that was good for me, I think. Okay. And then tell me, uh, was it was the USS Twiggs that you joined in I, Yeah, I joined. The, the, the Twiggs was not yet in commission. She was under construction in Charleston. And what they had done is they uh, gathered the crew together at Norfolk. And this was supposed to be some kind of pre-boarding uh, uh, training, I guess. It was not much training. It was, uh, it was mainly, I guess, maybe getting us to know each other and to know the petty officers we were going to be serving with, some of them who were there. But a lot of it was a waste of time. And, you know, they get you out before it was light and take you out there and do calisthenics. And if you've ever seen morning calisthenics, when it's really dark, we're sitting there doing this, you know, standing there doing this, while this guy's up there going through the calisthenics and all that. But, and we drilled around with fake guns in our shoulders and stuff like that. Um, I guess, let's see, in boot camp they had taught us how to shoot a gun. And uh, so I guess we didn't have to do any of that when we were in, in training in Norfolk. I think they wanted to get the crew all gathered together and located and kind of organized so that when we went aboard we kind of knew where we were and who these guys were that were bossing us around and so forth. So, and I think it really just served that kind of purpose for a relatively short period of time we were there. And then they shipped us down to Charleston and uh, marched us aboard ship and said, this is where you're going to live, fellas. Ship was under construction. <coughs> and uh, an interesting thing about putting ships in commission was that they were building a whole series of destroyers down there, and I swear the last one must have had no equipment of any kind. Because every night we went out with a jeep, stealing stuff off the docks that we wanted more of, you know, an extra this and an extra that. And you go out at night, draw midnight stores, and get it installed in your ship. So they must have run out of some stuff in the last one. It must have been a vacant hull by the time the guys got through with it. But uh, it was sort of equipping it to our likes and our expectations, or the officers' likes, you know, we need this, we need that, and suddenly it would appear. And uh, that's when I really, it's, it's at that point one begins to feel one has really joined the Navy. We're aboard for commissioning, impressive ceremony. Uh, the crew, about three quarters, I guess, had never been on a ship before. Uh, but we had a core of more experienced petty officers. And we had a group of officers, including the captain, the then captain, and a group of officers, and a group of senior petty officers, not chiefs, but for a lot of first class second-class petty officers, who'd been on the same ship together, the USS Gwynn, which had been sunk uh, with no loss of life. They were lucky the first time around. And, um, for example, on the bridge where I was, first-class signalman and the first-class quartermaster were both fr from the Gwynn. Uh, the, 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 uh, communications officer on the ship. We served under him. He was from the Gwynn, and it was just a crew of them all from the same ship. And uh, they began to try to teach us how to be part of a destroyer crew. They were interesting guys. Um, the chief quartermaster was a very quiet, unassuming guy. and. Uh, he, he tried, taught me by example. Um, there was a second class quartermaster, but we didn't pay much attention to him, and he was transferred off. But the first class, uh, Anderson, uh, Andy, was a, a quiet, unassuming guy, but 
he was little by little turning me into what a quartermaster ought to be, little things. Uh, and uh, by example, I guess, teaching me. Do you an example of some of those things? Well, well at one point, uh, well, I had been stationed down in the steering engine room going in and out of port. We were doing a lot of exercises going in and out of port. But then uh, finally they moved me up onto the bridge and this was a, and he would have me take the wheel going in and out of port and um, when we got close to where we were going he would relieve me and take the wheel and one day this was after we had left Charleston we'd gone out we were going to Pearl Harbor and uh, he really, he, I went up and took the wheel, a special sea detail. And uh, I'm standing there at the wheel and we're getting closer and closer in where we're going and I'm looking over my shoulder, where's Andy? And Andy just walked away and left me there. Mm -hmm. And from then on I took the ship in and out of port and I took the ship alongside for mail and everything like that. In fact, the captain preferred to have me. I'm obsessive, and if he said steer 174, I steered 174, not 176, not 175, not 173, but I steer 174. I mean, I would, he liked that obsessiveness of mine, I guess, but, um, and he used to do that. And then uh, his, uh, at that time there was another guy aboard, a chief quartermaster also, who was not from that same group, and he taught me some things too. But between the two of them, these two guys moved me from feeling I was a member of the, the bridge crew to I was one of the petty officers of the bridge crew. And they would make sure that if they told me to have something done, that I had it done, that I didn't do it myself. In fact, one day the chief just chewed me out because uh, I was still down in the after steering engine room and it had a leak and it needed to be cleaned. And he called me and he said, uh, called me up the bridge. He said, I have somebody clean up that steering engine room. So I said, okay, chief. yes, chief. So I got somebody and I went down with the guy I got and we started cleaning it up. And pretty soon I get called up to the bridge. And he says, I told you to have someone clean up the steering engine room. I did not tell you to clean up the steering engine room. Do you understand the difference? And he was very, very firm about that. And that stood me in good stead because I realized then that um, even more that I had to behave as a very junior but a certain kind of officer on that ship and I was, uh, I had a lot of seamen under me who, on the bridge crew who were quite a bit older than I was and uh, I learned that I had to make it clear to them that one of them, one, a couple of them, you're a seaman second class, I'm a petty officer first class and you do what I tell you and one of them uh, gave me a bad time when I was after him because he was supposed to be and like taking on ammunition, I guess. He was supposed to be working at it and he resented my telling him to do it. And uh, so I said, this is a guy named Ben Davis, called him Pop. Like ben, I said, you don't like it and I don't like it because you're much older than I am, but I'm a quartermaster third class, and you are a seaman second class, and I am telling you, you will get down there on that detail, or you'll be in deep trouble. And from then on, I had no problem with him. He knew that he wasn't gonna take advantage of me because I was young, and I knew that I had, that's the job I had to do, so I did it. And, The chief signalman was funny. The chief signalman taught me to be a really good signalman. And um, 
he used to sit around and he'd, he'd line us all up, all these young guys, and he'd tell us what were our strengths and what were our weaknesses and what we had to work on. And so he was a real, a real fine teacher and, a, and an absolutely wonderful signalman, unbelievable. Uh, he would, uh, he knew the damn general signal book by heart. So he, you didn't have to look at it. signals would come on. He didn't have to look them up in the book. Flag signals, for example. And uh, while we were at Norfolk, a lot of what happened on this ship is related to this. My experience on it. While I was still down in the after steering engine room, one one day uh, we were pulling out, and suddenly they turned the control over to me. I thought it was an exercise. It turned out we'd been hit by a merchantman backing out of the slip. And uh, we lost one guy and had damage to the ship and so forth. And um, the captain thereafter was relieved. A new captain came aboard, a guy named George Phillip. And uh, Captain Philip, who, and I'll tell you more about him later, who was one of the finest gentlemen I've ever known. Superb guy. And uh, he believed that he'd been a gunnery officer and had a great record as a gunnery officer. He was an Annapolis man. And he believed that the reputation of his ship among other ships and among the commanders of other ships and squadron commanders and so on, depended to a significant extent on how alert we were to visual signals. So his rule was simple. His rules were simple. No one must ever send our Morse code signal by light more than once. You have to answer it the first time. And when there are flag, there are flag hoists in the, in the squadron or whatever, <coughs> you will get yours up first. Well, that meant we had to have somebody on the bridge all the time with a long glass with an eye on the squadron lead commander's ship. And we didn't have enough signalmen to do that. And that's when I became a signalman. My watch was changed. Uh, from quartermaster watch to signal watch. I was the senior signalman on my watch, and I became a signalman. And, uh, Let's hold that for a minute because we have to change tapes. Thirteen, March 2001. Go ahead. You're telling us you became a signalman. I became a signalman, and uh, I began, and I began, at that time to build this enormous respect for this captain. And this built up all the time I was on aboard ship because I discovered that he had very high expectations for us. But he would go out of his way to thank you for a job well done. Uh, if he had to criticize anybody, he would make sure it was in private. But if he was going to compliment you, he'd make sure it was very public. And he would uh, uh, so watch out to express his, take every opportunity to express his confidence in the, in the enlisted men. Just at the last reunion that I went to, one of the, we were talking about uh, the two different captains we had, and somebody said, but this captain, George Phillip, he was an enlisted man's captain, and that's the way we saw him. But that started just at the time that he first came aboard and started this expectation that we had. So we would do things like, we went, we, uh, uh, after the ship went in commission, we spent some time in and out of Charleston. Uh, we did a shakedown out to Bermuda. Missed Bermuda by a substantial distance when we got there. And uh, I wasn't doing the navigating, so I don't know who was, but some we missed. But uh, 
and we ended up finding Bermuda and ended up, and also then going out and escorting uh, out, in, out into the Atlantic to escort a sh ship that had been damaged somehow. They were in, in combat, but I can't remember what had happened to them. But we had to go out and escort them in. We tugged them for a while until the tugs got there and brought them back in. And we were doing exercises of various kinds out of Charleston during that time. Uh, but then when we finished that, we headed down through the canal, through the Panama Canal, and rendezvoused with the USS. Well, we did that before we got to the canal. We rendezvoused with the USS Franklin, the carrier Franklin and the task force. And we escorted the Franklin up as far as Pearl Harbor. And all the time we were doing this, um, we would have flag hoist competitions um, among the various ships. And we'd have competition with the USS Franklin. And they had, I don't know how many damn flag bags and how many signalmen, but we had two flag bags and a small group of signalmen. But we could, we could get a flag hoist up faster than they could. We'd be knee deep in flags. They couldn't, no time to get them in the bag and you digging through trying to find an, an option somewhere or a zebra or whatever flag you needed to go up and run up. But uh, the captain just uh, inspired us to say, damn it, we're going to be the best signal ship in the, in the fleet. And uh, he would watch that and then he'd praise us for it, you know. And, uh, later on, and this skips in time, but it, it it's part of all this. Uh, one time we were in a formation, was a, a squadron of destroyers, and I was, I guess I was in second class, been promoted to second class quartermaster. I was signalman of the watch. But in the daytime, the whole signal crew had to be on the watch all day long, every day. So everybody was up there, but I was the responsible signalman of the watch. And uh, a flag hoist went up, and the guy who had the long glass on the squadron calls flag hoist, and I got up my glasses. We were traveling with the wind, cruising with the wind. And when that flag hoist came out of the squadron commander's, he was on the destroyer, came out of his flag bag, it came out and it just flopped right straight down. And you couldn't see it at all. And I was watching, and it was a signal, maybe uh, half a dozen flags in the signal. And I got every one of them coming out of the flag bag. As it flopped out, I'd catch it and call it, and then it would droop. And they'd go up the mast, and they'd just hang straight down on the mast. You couldn't see a thing. And we ran it up part way as soon as you get it and then the chief looked it up made sure of the signal he understood the signal when we two block it we two blocked it we're the only ones in the formation has the stand flag hoist up except the squadron commander so it was chow time so somebody relieved me and I went down to chow to, down the mess hall to eat and suddenly the I hear on the on the loudspeaker. Melville, quartermaster, second class, report to the bridge. Report to the bridge. So he's like, what the bridge? I'm still very young. Why am I reporting to the bridge? What did I do? I get up there and it says, the captain wants to see. And I said, ah, what did I do now? Well, I'm really scared. And he said, I just wanted to thank you for getting that flag hoist. And uh, it's very moving to me. This was. Uh, that he really appreciated what an enlisted man would do. He really appreciated that and went to that effort to thank me in public. And uh, one time I took a signal by light and uh, from a cruiser. Quartermasters on cruisers don't do signal work. So when you're doing, as you know, when you're signaling with light, you hold the light down, you blank the light, blink the light to say, I received that word, whatever it is. You do it by words, whole words. And um, if you're really feeling cocky, and some days you are, you hold the light down. When the signal starts, when the message starts, 
and you're saying to the signalman on the other end, you send just as fast as you can, man, I can get anything you can signal. And I did this on a 160-word message. Hold that damn thing down. Get to the end, and there was a time that was very important, and so I double-checked the time, interrogatory, resignaled the time, the guy said, correct, and I signaled, Roger, received from this cruiser. Blink the light, blinks the light. The guy in the cruiser blinks the light at me. He's going to say something else. And he says, INT, interrogatory, your rating. And I said, quartermaster, second class. And he kind of didn't believe it, because quartermasters don't signal on cruisers. And then sent me the message, well done. Captain reads the message, well done. He wants, he comes over, he wants to know who got the message, well done. Then he fed it to me. This is, that's a real officer, I think. Yeah. So that was my introduction to the captain, I think. So after you transited the canal, got to Pearl. We went to Pearl Harbor. Uh, let's see, the first time we went out there, we went out to Pearl Harbor. Um, I guess we went out and that was about the time of the engagement of Saipan and Tinian Islands. We went up to Tinian. That's the first time we saw a Japanese airplane. And then afterwards, I can't remember why, we escorted someone back to Pearl Harbor. We went to Pearl Harbor again and we stayed there for about a week. And we were equipped, they were equipping ships then with the long range navigation system, the Loran navigation system, and we were equipped with it, and I was sent to school to learn it in Pearl Harbor then. Um, but I think after that, then it was just a series as we um, joined various shifting task forces and so forth. Uh, but our duty pretty much from then on at uh, Lady Gulf, Mindoro Island, Luzon, Lingayen Gulf, Iwo Jima, and Okinawa was all pretty much the same thing. Um, we were generally in the group that was escorting the troop ships in, or and a couple times escorting the uh, small carriers. Uh, we had some some real experiences with those guys. Picked up something like two hundred men of, from the USS Omni Bay, small carrier, at Lady. And they got sunk, and we're picking people out of the water and so forth. But mainly, our we would we would um, escort the troops in, troop ships in, often do shore bombardment, but not always. Lady Gulf, it was pretty much escort them in, but uh, in, uh, especially in Iwo and Okinawa, a lot of shore bombardment. So uh, that was our duty from then on. So we were around for the famous battle of the battles of the Lady Gulf, steaming around in the harbor, making as much smoke as we could possibly make from our stacks and our smoke making machines. We were sticking out from the smoke, which wasn't so good, but we were protecting the troops. It was hiding the battleships from the from the uh, Japanese. And of course that's when, about then, that's when they started doing the kamikazes. And the first time, you s that's an experience, the first time you see that, you don't believe that's going to happen. It's Tell us about it. First time, when they first started, they were going after aircraft carriers, for obvious reasons. And the way they did would to go after a carrier was they'd get up in the sun and try to come in out of the sun. 
and uh, so that you, you just presume we couldn't see them coming. Usually we could if you kept your eye out for them and you had binoculars and if they were going, especially if they were going after somebody else than you because you had a different line of sight. Um, and you see them start going down and you just can't believe they're not going to pull out of this the first time. You just can't believe they're not going to pull out of it. And uh, But then they either crash into the plane, the ship, or crash into the sea. And usually into the sea because they were pretty easy to elude when they were attacking that way because they were coming straight down as fast as they could go and had no control once they, they, they had no maneuverability, they couldn't maneuver at all. So if you could maneuver the ship a little, uh, you could avoid them. There was some hit and they, with dreadful results. Uh, and uh, one of our sister ships, the Harridan, was hit up there and we had to escort her back to safety. But uh, after that, they, is when they, the Iwo and especially at Okinawa, they changed their tactics and went after destroyers and that changed the, the ball game. And they did, and they changed the tactic in the sense that they came in low over the water. And the radar had great difficulty picking them up over the water. Low, things low over the water didn't come in well on the radar at all. And so people would, they'd get lost on would lose them on the radar, and uh, but that was mainly the going on at Iwo, but as, as I say, especially at Okinawa, so they were really dreadful in that. Iwo was interesting. I saw the, uh, I had my binoculars on the island when the flag went up on Suramachi. That was so. That saw it go up. Um, you're hanging around on the on the bridge, there's not much signaling going on. When you're in, we were into 600 yards off the, off the, off the island <laughs> doing, doing fire support. And that's not far when it comes to you know, taking a look through your binoculars. So I saw that go up. The first flag or the second flag? The first one, the real one. <laughs> this was not an enactment. <laughs> this was real. Uh, Iwo, um, the, the greatest impression I had of Iwo was watching these guys in these damned little landing craft, climbing into those landing craft and heading for that beach. Because there was practically no beach there. And God, just uh, watching them go over there, and you'd say, oh my God, it's, what a thing, because they were under fire immediately once they were heading in. We watched the frogmen go in before. That was, you had to admire these guys, but that was a little less dangerous because the, the Japanese weren't keying in on them and firing at them. But those landing craft were really taking a beating. And, uh, saving Private Ryan later on in my life had a real impact largely, I think, because of that. Boy, I just remember these guys doing that, knowing that their kids my age, you know, said, shoo, it was rough, it was rough. Okinawa was another thing because Okinawa was, as you all well know, was the, the roughest thing the Navy faced, I think, in the entire war. And uh, we were doing, um, escorted troop ships in, did a lot of shore bombardment. The day of the invasion, was it April 1st? Uh, day of the invasion, uh, they had a ring of destroyers, a ring of cruisers, and a ring of battleships. And by God, they were pounding that island. And, um, and there, when the guys went ashore, there was nothing on the beach. Uh, later on, it was real nasty, but there was nothing on the beach. I mean, it was just, Everything was wiped out there, and uh, uh, but the tough the tough duty for destroyers there was the radar picket duty where you went off on a radar picket line, and uh, 
First time we went on radar picket duty was one of the days when the Japanese sent a lot of planes down. And by the end of the day, there wasn't a single on the northern part of the radar picket line. I don't think there was a ship up there that was the same ship that started the day. They were all hit. I mean, they were going back one after the other and being replaced. We went up onto one of the most northern points of the picket line and there were two previous destroyers had been up there and the first, the second one relieved the first, we relieved the second, both of which had been hit. And then the thing stopped and we spent, I don't know, five days on radar picket duty and never saw a hostile character of any kind. We thought it was pretty good duty. Um, but the second time wasn't so good, so. And in April uh, 28th, I guess it was, yeah, April 28th, uh, we got hit. Um, a um, kamikaze came in, but he, he flew too high, and he was clearing the superstructure but he hit one of the, his wing tip apparently hit a guy wire from the mast and it just swung him back around. He came in from the port side and he hit the starboard, starboard forward just below the superstructure. And we lost 10 men killed in that one. An executive officer was injured, a number of men injured, badly injured. So, uh, and we went in for repairs in Karama Reto. Went in for repairs and they patched us up and sent us back out. And the first night we were out, I think it was the first night, we were a little more nervous by that time. Uh, you know, the, the immortality thing had worn off. Uh, up until we got hit, I think, we still believed that nobody could possibly Nothing could bad could possibly happen to us. We'd see the, these other ships all beat to hell, and well, it wasn't going to happen to the toys. Well, then it did. And so the, I think it was the first night we were out, and uh, the captain was in his emergency cabin on the bridge. And he came out to the bridge, as he would do when things were, even when things were quiet, right onto the bridge. He was just back at the... At the back part of the superstructure and he came out and all of a sudden he shouted hard hard left to the helmsman and we did a hard left and we did this and this ship this airplane came down and hit the water right piece of way where we had been you know, loaded apparently with gasoline and boy that just thing went up in flames and that's when I found out that it's really true your knees could knock <laughs> your knees can really move uh, that was scary because I, I think at that time all of us realized uh, that that was a dangerous business out there. You could get hurt. And uh, then we stayed out until June. And uh, on June 16th, two, two significant events, I guess. The first one was that the captain received orders for us to rendezvous with the USS Paul Hamilton, our sister ship, and all this. And uh, I think a tanker, we were to rendezvous at like five o'clock in the morning and come back to the States. Uh, obviously to be reconditioned, to be ready to go back out to go to the invasion in Japan which was not to be, of course. Um, and we were stationed off the western side of Okinawa. And we're not sure what happened. A plane came out of somewhere. We're not sure where. We were not at general quarters. We were at one lower level of readiness because there were no reported ships or anything, the planes in the vicinity. Um, but our job was to make sure that nobody escaped off the island. The Japanese were being pushed 
down to the edge and we would just to, to provide harassment fire if it was needed or whatever there. And so we were moving very slowly and we were not at general quarters. A plane appeared from somewhere. Um, one of the things we have been told, and it's in that history that I gave you, one of our survivors was told by a marine pilot that they had been out on a flight and had come back and they suddenly discovered that there was one more plane with them in the formation than there was supposed to be. And before they could do anything about it, this plane took off. And that's, we think, he thought that they heard an immediate explosion and he thinks that's the plane that got us. But whatever it was, they torpedoed forward and hit in the vicinity of the forward magazines. And we were fully loaded with 5 inch and 42 millimeter, but the 5 inch obviously was the big thing. And um, what it did was it blew the entire front, everything from the, including the superstructure and the mast, just went up this way. And it lifted the deck right off. And uh, the mess hall was right over the, that. Chief's quarters were over the, that area, and the officers' quarters were over that area. And most of the officers were down there, except the one on watch and the captain and a couple others. Um, most of the, a lot of the, good number of the chiefs were down at chief quarters. And the rough forward of the mess hall was a sleeping compartment. I must admit, it's a sleeping compartment, so everybody who was there immediately was lost. Um, we had been on the bridge, a bunch of us on the bridge, and when we secured from general quarters, somebody said, let's go down the mess hall, and let's, let's go down and play some cards. We'll go down the mess hall, play some cards. And somebody, God bless him, I don't know which, which one it was, oh, no, no, I... I've got to go. I got to go write some letters. And I said, "Well, yeah, I really need to write a letter too." So some of the guys headed aft. Some headed down to the, their sleeping quarters forward. And I headed for the chart room, which was one below the top deck of the bridge, <coughs> near the radio shack. And I was in there when we got hit. And what clearly happened was the I was in this thing that did this and I still see the most scary thing uh, was a wall of fire. Um, wall of fire between me and where I thought I wanted to go. But that wasn't where the the hatch was, um, the door was down below me, it turned out. I swear I, rem I swear I heard the wooden stool I was sitting on break, but that's maybe a figment of my imagination, I don't know. And somehow I got out of there and crawled out and got over, ended up on the main deck on the port side. Um, some people got off the bridge. Uh, the then guy who had become the executive officer was on the bridge and he got off. He was talking to the captain about arrangements for returning the next morning. And apparently, so he must have headed toward the wheelhouse and the captain maybe went out the other e exit from his emergency cabin and the captain was killed. And some people were trapped up there. Um, one of my friends is a torpedo man, was up there in the torpedo phones. 
And he finally, after years, it was difficult for him, told of a, overhearing a conversation between the chief, the signal, the communications officer, who was a lieutenant, and the chief signalman, the guy I respected so much, Bet as the chief signalman. Apparently both were trapped and their clothes were burning. And Bettis asked the, gun, the uh, officer if he had a knife because Bettis wanted to slit his wrists because he was trapped. And they had this conversation in the, in the gunner and the officer told him, hang in there, we'll get off. They both were killed. So it was like that. A bad experience. I got down on the port side of the ship and we put a... I was slightly wounded, I didn't even realize it. Um, and we managed to get a uh, one of the life rafts over the side. Somebody still had a knife on hand to cut the line. So when we got as many men as we could find hanging on the outside of the life raft. We had one guy sitting in it. You can't as many sit in a life raft. It's built for hanging on to, not sitting in. Um, there was one guy in a kind of a fog and he had a little weak flashlight and he was holding this light so somebody could see us. And uh, we pulled away from the ship and um, in the meantime, we could see, well, as soon as I got down on deck, we could see that the, at, at the rear of the ship, I didn't know just where it turned out, it was at the number four gun. There was a raging fire going there. And uh, I could just see that there was a fire there. And one could see that the ship was rapidly sinking because the whole bow was gone. There wasn't anything that could possibly save this ship. Um, the mast just laid straight out over the stacks, the bullnose straight up in the air, um, and raging fire. Uh, and we began to pull away. Apparently back on the fantail, the guys were getting out of the engine room, the fire room. Uh, the people in the after sleeping quarters were getting up on the deck. And about the time that they realized that we just got to get the hell out of here, whether we're wounded or not, and get the wounded into whatever we can and get them off, uh, about the time they realized that and got in the water and hadn't gone far, in the meantime, what was happening was the, the 40 millimeter shells were popping all around them because they, they were just blowing up in the, in the heat from the fire. But then the fire had gotten into the handling room of the five inch and then dropped down into the magazines and then blew the after magazines. Oh boy, that didn't leave much ship in between. I was in the water, I don't know how long, maybe 20, 25 minutes something like that. And then I got picked up by the USS Putnam, who picked up quite a few of us. That's when I discovered, when they started wiping the oil off my face, I discovered that uh, I did have some cuts and bruises, and I, my face was cut out, my shoulder and so forth, but not like a lot of guys. Um, we had a radar technician who claimed he was the only guy who got off the ship without getting oil, covered in oil. He got blown clear. And he survived. <laughs> God only knows how. So we lost 126 men that night. It's odd, you'll see it on a thing I gave you there that among all the surface vessels of World War II, in terms of total, absolute numbers killed, that ranked us 30th in World War II. If you did it on a percentage, it goes up around 20 because some of those were carriers and cruisers and battleships and so forth. But uh, we lost at number 30. We could do without that being in that Hall of Fame.
Mm. And then we were transferred, I was transferred to a, uh, a the rescue, a uh, hospital ship. And uh, a bunch of the guys were on the rescue and then back to, I went back to the field hospital at Guam and then came back to the States. And uh, by the time I reported back after survivors leave, the war had ended. So what did you do after the war? Uh, after the war, after I got out, uh, I went to college, as I had always hoped I would be able to do. I went to college, Ohio Wesleyan University in Central Ohio. Graduated in 1950. Got married, had some children. Went to graduate school. Went to graduate school at Harvard in economics and got a PhD. Uh, started teaching, taught briefly at the University of Massachusetts, but then I was asked to go back to my alma mater in Ohio Wesleyan and join the faculty there, which I did. And uh, left there after six years, I guess it was. Um, did a tour of duty with the U.S. government, working with the United States Congress on a study project. Um, then took a job at struggling Little Harper College in Binghamton, New York. Came here. Then I took a at three was it after three years I took a two year leave, and I went to Chile on the staff of, the, of Harvard University's law school doing, uh, running in what they call their international tax program and working on studies of the tax system of Chile and I did that for two years with my family, lived in Chile. Really nice experience for a family, for the, for the kids, just great experience for kids. Uh, then I came back and uh, I loved teaching and I was reputed to be very good at it. And I got hired here because of my reputation as a good teacher. But I got back and we'll leave, and in the spring, I was asked to be temporary chairman of my department of economics. And then in the spring, the newly appointed dean, they had restructured the university, and they had two associate dean positions, and the dean, who I had worked some with and knew very well, came in and asked me if I would take a position as associate dean for administration. And after some complex reasoning about the whole thing, I decided I would try it because it's better to try it where you're teaching than go someplace else and try something like that. So try it where you're teaching. Presumably they like you. And uh, I decided I'd give it a try. And I think it was 18 years later I stopped doing that. I did that, then I completely changed my career. Um, stayed there until uh, 1987, I guess it was, 86, 87. And uh, for a p very complex and strange reasons, uh, I was made managing director of a brand new arts, performing arts center we had built on the campus. And they even paid me while I did this job. And uh, so I did that for a few years, and then I said, it's time to retire. And I wrote to, to the dean who was, to whom I reported, and who was a good friend of mine. We'd been colleagues, and I wrote a woman, I wrote to her, and I said, I have determined that I cannot go to the factory every day and still do the things I want to do. So this is to tell you that as of February 28, 1990, I will resign. And I didn't say I intend to resign, I said I will resign. And I've been enjoying retirement ever since. Well, let's pause there.
Tape 3, interview with Mr. Robert Freeman Melville on 13 March 2001. Um, let me ask a couple of questions. I'll bounce around a little bit. Uh, tell us about your children. I have four children. Uh, the oldest two boys, the younger two girls. Uh, the two boys both live in Juneau, Alaska. Uh, the older of the two, really his interest is in writing poetry and in painting and painting and writing. Uh, he went to RIT after bouncing around a little, not knowing what he was going to do. He was a conscientious objector at the time of the Vietnam War. Uh, he bounced around not knowing what he was going to do and then he ended up working for a newspaper for a short time and then he went to, went to um, uh, printing school at Rochester Institute of Technology, which is a superb printing school, and graduated there. Met his wife, who was in the printing school, and uh, they decided when they graduated not to look for a printing job, but look for a job in Alaska. The main incentive being his wife's, my daughter-in-law's father owned printing company in New Jersey and they wanted to get as far away from that printing company as they could because they didn't want to end up having to run that printing company. So they did it by going to Alaska and they run a, now they, they own a copy company up in Juneau and uh, have four children and uh, he succeeded in doing what he always said you have to do. If you're an artist you've got to find a woman who can support you. So what he did is he married this printer. They started the copy company. She decided she wanted to get back into running the copy company rather than raising the kids. So he's a house husband who has time to do his, his art and his painting and his, his writing poetry. And he helps with the, with the shop, but he does a lot of the bookkeeping on the, co on the computer. And she really runs the shop, so he succeeded in working that one up. Second son is the brains of the outfit. Brilliant student. When he graduated from high school, he had the high, seventh highest regent score in the state of New York. He remembers everything. He is a sponge for factual information. Went to college at Yale. Did rather well. They told him he should major in science because he was very good at it. After one science chemistry course, he said, I don't like science. I want to study history. They thought it was crazy. So he majored in history, went to graduate school at Duke, got a PhD in British Empire and Commonwealth history. Big market for those people, I'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> he ended up going to Alaska to spend a year recuperating from all his years of study and working in the copy shop to stay alive. He's still in Alaska. That was 10, 12 years ago. No, more than that. It was a long time ago. And he's been up there ever since, I guess, maybe pushing 15 years now. So he's up there. He's single and has made a great career out of involvement in the arts in Juneau, which has a big art colony, and spoiling his nieces and nephews up there because he has. The other son has a daughter and three sons, so he's in charge of spoiling them, and he has a great time. Then I have a daughter, the next one was a daughter who uh, ended up studying uh, social work. She went to college at Oswego and then went to Ohio State and studied social work, got a master's degree, married a clinical psychologist. They have two children, live in Charlottesville, very nice place to live, Virginia. And then I have one daughter who lives close to home here. She's the, uh, she always thought of herself as not a student, but she ends up, she's a lawyer. She has a, uh, you now get a doctorate in law when you go to law school. And uh, she's, a, she's smart. She knows that you work to live, you don't live to work. And she is now 
co uh, town attorney for the town of Owego, right near here, and uh, is now married and has one stepson, her husband, but she has an adopted child. She adopted a girl from a little baby from China a year and a half ago. And that's my little one, my little granddaughter. And that's the one that I see a lot because she's close to home. So they're all, they're all very successful in the sense that, to me, they, they're doing what they want to do. And I don't know, that's the way to spend your life, it seems to me. And what, what are you doing in your retirement? Um, I do several things. I, uh, I'm a voracious reader, but I read mainly now history, mostly United States history. I started with a reading mainly history around the Civil War period, the political history leading up to the war mainly, and the Reconstruction period, battles. I try to stay away from battles. <laughs> I, don't, I don't enjoy battles anymore. Uh, but I, I work at that period in history, and I read everything I've, and everything good about Lincoln that's been written about Lincoln I've read, I guess. And then I, um, but I've branched out, I get back to colonial times, I read some European history, but I read an awful lot of history. And what I do is I have the advantage of having a university library at my disposal, because as an emeritus professor I have library privileges at the university. So I get everything I want to read over there. I taught myself with some help, mainly from books though. I taught myself to do matting and framing. And I have mat cutter, fine mat cutter, and I'm using a, just a basic table saw and a router. I make frames. I've got a couple things home now that in the process that I'm framing. Um, so I enjoy doing that and I enjoy the, I think what I particularly like is that I enjoy making something and after spending my life pushing paper. So I make things around the house. My wife will say, gee, I could use a such and such and I end up making one. I've got a little table that I made to match a table that we had bought and uh, it involved setting a tile down in the top of the table. And I made that with just these few tools. And now I've got to make a small one just like it so she can use it as a step stool because she needs a step stool. So uh, I've got things all around the house that I made just to fool around with wood I'd, in the cuttered, what I call the cuttered workshop. But uh, so I do that kind of thing. Uh, I do a little work in the community. I've done quite a bit of work in the community. I was on the board of a, an arts organization for five or six years. For seven years I was on the advisory board for the Broome County Department of Mental Health where I learned a lot about uh, various health infirmities and the needs that people have and so forth. So, but now I have given up those kinds of things for a while. I work in a, in a, one of the uh, food pantries that we have in Broome County, mm -hmm. chow food pantries. I spend some time working in that. I'm a house husband. <laughs> I'm taking up baking. I've got a bread machine. And I bake bread. Now, how many years were you at Harper? Let's see, from 1961 to 1990. 29 years. 29 years. You must have seen an enormous amount of change in this. Oh, my God. When I came, it was this little college. Um, a few buildings, didn't look like a university, and now it's a major university. And I, I take a lot of pride in it, in the fact that I was in there in that growth period. And I came to Harper because of its, rec even in Ohio, we knew about Harper College in 1960. It was an interesting experiment in public education. 
a prestigious liberal arts college in a state university system, a small prestigious liberal arts college. When I got here, they already had superb students. I mean, some of these students were so damn good that I had. There's one, one guy I had who has a, an endowed chair at Cornell. And I always, I used to tell him that I always believed that I should turn out students who are better than me in my field. But I said he just went to extremes. He didn't have to go that far. <laughs> and uh, he's really a brilliant guy, but a hell of a nice guy. And uh, introduces me to his family saying, I'm the person that caused him to become an economist. So I took great pride in these great students. But then we succeeded in making the transition from this small prestige liberal arts college to a, a university of some size without losing the quality of the undergraduate program. The students are just as good. And the faculty are just as devoted to teaching these good students. We managed to recruit, and I was involved in some of this, we managed to recruit to our faculty people who were fine research scholars, but who loved to teach good undergraduate students. And they're hard to find. The scholars want to go off and do their thing. And, um, but they really like working with our good students because we, we got that kind of faculty. And I'm very proud of my contribution to that. How is it possible to get a small college like that to grow into a, a university without losing quality? I think two things happened. One, I think it was well established in its reputation for undergraduate education by the time the conversion even was thought of. I mean, it was really people, we were getting students in competition with Cornell. You know, it was, uh, and we were cheaper, so we were, we were winning a lot of that competition. Uh, then the faculty, I think the key was that, that as we recruited faculty, we would talk with them and make clear the commitment we had to good quality undergraduate education. And we promoted people who were, whose real contribution to the university was through the teaching program, not through research, and gave tenure to such people. I, I came as an associate professor. I was promoted to full professor and tenured on the basis of my work in the undergraduate program. And when you do that, you send a message to the faculty that it's okay to be a damn good teacher. And uh, that contribution will be recognized and rewarded, maybe in different ways than the, than the scholar is rewarded, but we give distinguished teaching professor awards. And, uh, People recognize this, and the climate is very good for it. The, the intellectual climate for undergraduate education is very, very good. So, Do you have any idea it was going to grow so much when you Oh, no. Out? When I first came, they were talking about maybe getting to 2,000 students or something, you know. It was 1,200 and up to 2,000 maybe. It was the scientists who pushed. Scientists, I think rightly, said that they in order to attract um, the kind of graduate, uh, the kind of students they wanted to work with, they had to have good research programs going. In order to have good research growing student programs going, they had to have good graduate students to work with. And these things built back and forth on each other. And they were probably right. But uh, the students are still good. Earlier you talked about uh, how the sea has always had sort of an appeal for you. Um, uh, what was the, the um, you ever read Captain Hornblower? Okay, I read Captain Hornblower when I was <coughs> in high school, I suppose. Read Captain Hornblower, liked it. Never went to this on the sea, but I just loved reading about the sea. 
Uh, there was a certain romance about it, I suppose. And it's something that has stayed with me. Uh, I still read about the sea. You ever read Patrick O'Brien's books? I love, I've been through all of them, love them. Uh, I've read, I'm reading right now a history of the slave trade, but a part of, part of what fascinates me is that it's the same kind of vessels that carried out the slave trade in the 14 and 1500s that we talk about with Patrick O'Brien. They became men of war, some ship, basic changes, but the basic ship remains the same. And that fascinates me. And uh, have you ever read a book called The Yard? Oh, it just came out recently. Yeah. About Baz Langerwood. Yeah, it's really very good. Yeah. And one of the things that captivated me, we still launched a ship then, the way they launched them back in the 1500s, you know, it was the same process. There's something about that that I find interesting. You also talked about how, how before the war you felt that as a young man that it was important for the United States to be involved in the war in Europe. Why? Because Uh, a civilization was about to be destroyed by a very evil person, a very evil group of people. And I thought that, the, that the, it was the duty of the civilized world to support each other and save that civilization. A lot of people were getting killed. And uh, I didn't believe that we could lose Europe and England and that we could survive in that kind of a world. And uh, I remember getting into an argument with my seventh grade teacher in 1937 about these kinds of things. When I, I was married twice, my first wife, when I was first married, my father wrote to her and said, He's a good boy, but he is kind of serious. And uh, I'm less serious now than I was then, I guess. But uh, it, was, uh, it was a view I had of the world, I guess. And I think it was influence of my parents, my mother especially, a very well-educated woman, uh, unusual for the, her generation. Well, did we save the civilization? We saved it from that threat. I think. I think I read one of the other things I do read in history now is the history of the, of the Nazi period. And uh, it's ugly, it's ugly, it's ugly. And the thing that's ugliest about it is the support that they received from the ordinary German people. And that's the frightening part of it. That's why I think it's so important you have to guard against this kind of thing so well because. We're human beings, and we slip into the ugliest kind of behavior. You recall when you first heard about uh, the atomic bombs dropping in Japan? I was home on leave from uh, uh, I had gotten out of the hospital, naval hospital in Guam, came back to the U.S., got back home, and all of us were first given 30 days rest and recovery leave. They called it survivor's leave at that time. We got 30 days survivor leave. And then we were, we were stationed at the nearest base to our homes for a minimum of 90 days or something like that. I went back to the Fargo building. I finished my career discharging people at the Fargo building, living at home south of 20 miles south of Boston. Pretty good duty. Did you have any uh Feelings when you heard about the bomb being dropped? Um, I think that, I guess I was overwhelmed by the feeling of relief. I did believe, and I do believe now, that an invasion of Japan was going to be a bloody thing indeed. Uh, and I think in retrospect, I think I'm right, not the people who said the Japanese were going to quit. The Japanese were training their civilians to fight in the streets and on the beaches in Japan. And I saw, had reason to, <laughs> to believe 
that the Japanese were willing to give up their lives for that country and that for the rulers of that country. And I had a lot of personal reason to believe that. Captain Phillips was, was killed over Okinawa? Yeah, yeah, he was killed. Um, there was a, a frigate named after him, the USS George Phillip. Um, he had the Navy Cross, and uh, he was highly, highly, highly respected by his officer colleagues and by his enlisted men. And um, I think that his leadership was recognized by the Navy, and naming a ship after him. Very unusual for a, a destroyer commander to get a ship named after him, a frigate. And um, the USS George Phillip uh, is something that they happened that I had to miss, but was in Okinawa. And they invited survivors of the Twigs to join them at Okinawa. And I couldn't make it because I was traveling overseas and just getting home the day it was happening. But uh, they had a memorial service. They, they located where the, the ship is lying and had a memorial service for the crew. Of the, uh, for those who died on the ship off there. And um, that's where something very important happened in terms of one of the things I want to tell you about, which I could do right now. Um, the captain's son and daughter, George Philip Jr., George Philip III, and Snow Philip, the daughter, joined the group who went on the went out to Okinawa and went out to the memorial service. And by that time their mother was deceased and had been cremated and they dropped her ashes over the spot where the ship was, saying and at least in that sense they could be together. Following that, Snow Phillip, who is a a journalist, she's on a newspaper, Key West newspaper staff, mm. wrote an article which we end up, most of us, seeing, in which she talked about that experience. She wrote this article for her newspaper, and she writes about this reunion and this memorial service. But that takes her then another step, where she writes about <clears throat> the great, the difficulty which she has and which she thinks a lot of people her age have who lost their fathers in World War II when they were infants. Their mothers quite understandably remarried. And for a lot of them apparently the mothers felt that to spend too much time telling the children what a wonderful man their father was and what a fine human being he was, not what a hero he was, but what a fine human being, would somehow be disloyal to the second husband. And they, these people refer to themselves as quasi-orphans. And they're going through, this begins to affect them when they reach their middle age. And they begin to have very, very serious problems because they feel they don't know their fathers. They don't really know who their fathers really were. 
because in her case it's the extreme, I guess. She knows her father's a hero. He had a ship named after him. But what, what kind of a, what kind of a, was he a warm human being or wasn't he? She doesn't know. She doesn't know any of these things. Uh, I took it upon myself last late fall, early winter, to write her a letter. And uh, to tell some of my stories about him as a human being, this, the way some of the things I've told you, um, his, his, his uh, devotion to his men, for example. And uh, she wrote and thanked me, a very moving letter to me, and thanked me for this letter, and uh, which she had found very moving. And, but expanded a little on this theme of it was so helpful to her, for her to hear from an enlisted man who had a different perspective than an officer had, a different relationship, and saw him in a different light, and saw him in a different way. And I told her he was among the, the very few people I respected the most in my life. I saw how he responded when he had to write. He would be up in the in the sea cabin, the, the emergency cabin off the bridge. He'd come out of there onto the bridge, and he'd been, I happen to know, he'd been writing letters to the families of people who were lost, and I could see what it was doing to him. And uh, I could see him jump vigorously to the defense of enlisted men. I overheard him. The only time I ever heard him chew somebody out in public was he was scolding an officer for denigrating <laughs> something he said denigrating the enlisted men. Uh, so I told her about these things and but in, in writing back she says you know that is very helpful but it, it helps me move towards seeing him as a human man, human being but there's still so much missing and I happen to know of another case uh, of someone who was the son, and then uh, in the same situation, he was just uh, his father. This guy's father was one of those guys killed in the Battle of the Bulge. You know, he was short time to serve, and boom, he was gone. And he is now in his fifties, and he's showing. So I happen to know. I have reason to have some contact about him. He's he's. Um, demonstrating some very strange behavior having to do with people owe him a lot and I think it is this he is a survivor and he's having a hard time with being a survivor he's a survivor in the sense that his father was taken from him and he never got him back in any sense of the word and now he thinks others owe him something to and he's behaving very strangely from, from, from how he had behaved uh, when he was in his, in his youth and in his early, earlier life. Uh, and I think that there are a lot of people out there that are having this very difficult time. And I don't think we think about them when we think about who are victims, who are victims of a war. They're very much victims, and another family, uh, a stepfather, doesn't quite do the trick. It's, uh, and, uh, it's uh, you don't, we don't ever think about them, but I do now because of these latter this correspondence. How did you hear about this program? Heard it on the radio, <coughs> local. Public station. I uh, uh, was given a number to call, and, and uh, I said, believing in history, <laughs> um, the value of history, uh, what we learn, what we can learn, uh, I decided it was a thing I ought to do. Prompt maybe in part by the fact that twice now, uh, once for a son and once for 
a grandchild of my, a grand, once for a grandson, and once for a granddaughter of a sister, I've had to explain, talk about some of this. An interesting thing is that when I talk to my grandson about it, I sent him some material, some of the things I gave you. I sent him the material. He was doing a report for class or something, you know. And uh, then he came up to visit, and uh, we were sitting at my other daughter's pond um, a week ago. And uh, my, the grandson, this was the grandson from Charlottesville, and his mother, my other daughter, was there. And the son started asking me more about it. And, and my, my daughter said, let me sit down here. I've never heard much of this. And it's, it's an interesting thing that, that uh, I can remember more, and I was saying to your colleague here, I can remember more now about all this than I could have remembered this well when I was 30 or 35. I was involved in my career, my family, everything else. And these things become more and more important as you get older. I know before I started my reunion, uh, there was a thing on the morning, Sunday morning television show. What was the guy who used to run this thing who was so good, who ran the trail? He used to travel around the world, but he was showing something. And I was down getting breakfast. My wife, my current wife, was upstairs. And she came down to see me weeping. Um, they were showing a burial at sea. And I had experience seeing a burial at sea. When we picked up the, we escorted a sister ship. One of the guys we rescued died aboard ship. And we had a burial at sea. And that was, seeing that again, just brought all this out again, you know. And, it's, uh, and I think that happens to us as we get older. And... Uh, so uh, that kind of drove me to say we, I think we owe it to those who come after us to share some of this. Well, we'll give you the last word. Any last thoughts? No, I'm glad you guys are doing this because, I, as I say, I think it's important that it be done. And, and, uh, uh, and it's your last chance because we're getting older. Every every issue I get of this, I have a, there's a new in memoriam. Two very close friends here, and uh, we're getting old, and we're not going to live forever. And uh, if we don't do it now, it's not going to happen. Well, thank you very much. Well,